So this came about uh, because of uh, construction that was going to be happening in our house, uh, namely the remodeling of our kitchen. And there was a general consensus that it would be very best if I was not in the house at the time that all of this happened. And so uh, this idea uh, of uh, sending me away for three weeks uh, to uh, travel the Southern Atlantic uh, sort of came to fruition. And uh, the project was uh, uh, handled locally. And the big plan was to get it all done by the time I got home in March of 2018. And that almost happened. Yeah. No, it sounds like it's just starting. Uh, is there a problem? Seven. Seven but I took hold, you. hold on a second. Um, everyone else needs to mute. Um, only Joe should be heard right now. Okay, we good? Okay, so um, this is uh, a program that I intended to give, um, uh, I guess, last spring, and it got postponed for a variety of reasons until after the COVID epidemic was over. And so here we are, I'm so pleased the COVID epidemic is over. And uh, so I'm able to uh, give this talk uh, in person. Here I am. Um, in any event, uh, this was uh, a trip that I booked on Silver Seas Expeditions. And uh, this was on board the uh, motor vessel Silver Cloud, which is, I believe, classified as a mega yacht uh, rather than a cruise ship. And uh, this particular ship holds under 300 passengers, unlike some of the cruise ships that ha are made like small cities with thousands of passengers. And uh, this was the planned route um, leaving Ushuaia and uh, heading over to Cape Town and multiple stops in the Falkland Islands, South Georgia. And I was particularly excited by being able to visit Tristan da Cunha. At least I thought I was going to be able to visit it and ending up in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, so uh, uh, an interesting uh, route. Uh, that has places that I've sort of dreamt about since I was 11 years old. And having an opportunity to go to some of these places was um, uh, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, but uh, the way this worked out is that um, we started out in Santiago, Chile, where I've been several times, but I've never managed to get up into the highlands where there is this iconic shorebird uh, that lives in uh, sort of uh, moist depressions uh, called the diadem sandpiper plover. And uh, I believe that this is a, a young bird that's transitioning into adult plumage, but a very distinctive uh, looking bird. And uh, I had originally hired uh, a guide named Rodrigo Reyes to take me up there to see this uh, diadem sandpiper plover, as well as other highland species, a lot of uh, interesting birds up in the highlands above Santiago, Chile. And two days before he's supposed to meet me and take me up there, I get an email from him saying that he's stuck in Patagonia on an island where he can't get off because of bad weather but he's contacted somebody else who's going to pick me up and take me up there. And that turned out to be wonderful. A uh, young man named Daniel Tehran, who uh, guided me uh, on this visit up to see the, uh, the sandpiper plover. Now, is this a sandpiper or is this a plover? Well, it has some features of both. It's currently classified as a plover. Uh, and it has a world population less than 7,000, and it's declining. It's listed as near threatened. So I saw three of them, uh, as well as a, a number of other um, highland species that I was excited by. Um, the, uh, on the way back, 
we stopped at a, at a creek and I saw this thing that I thought might be a grebe way, way, way up in the distance. And it got closer and closer and closer and eventually hauled itself out under the bridge. This is a female torrent duck. They live in rushing streams uh, and um, uh, specialistic also of uh, high Andes. And look at the feet on that thing. You see the way the, the webbing is kind of notched in and they have these long toes, which I think are for uh, holding on to slippery rocks. Uh, species is also the only duck that has wing spurs. Um, so I was uh, uh, talking to uh, Daniel and uh, on our way back down, he wanted to know if I had ever seen a burrowing parrot and the answer is I'd never even heard of a burrowing parrot, uh, but it certainly sounded like something that I wanted to get involved with. And so we agreed to go out the next day and look for burrowing parrot, uh, uh, a Chilean endemic that's found, well, it's actually, I think, found, found in part of Argentina too. But on the way up to, uh, to look for the, uh, for the burrowing parrot, uh, Daniel spotted this little guy. Well, it's not that little, it's, it's the Chilean tinamou. And tinamous are those mystery birds of the tropic, uh, the neotropics that are heard all of the time, but nobody ever sees them. And Audubon, and, the local Audubon club meeting, and the presenter is someone I know. Uh -huh. Someone needs to mute. And so this is the only picture I could get of the Chilean tinamou uh, sort of hiding behind some, um, some of the uh, vegetation, a very shy bird, and it uh, does not come out uh, in the open. This is, uh, species is reportedly declining, uh, especially in the northern part of its range. So then we ended up in this quarry with a lot of heavy machinery uh, where we were able to find these burrowing parrots uh, and this is uh, uh, endangered in Chile. There's only uh, five to 6,000 uh, individuals surviving there. Uh, and you can see the Chilean race has these bright yellow uh, belly. Uh, there, there is a population in Argentina. But what it's famous for is interconnected zigzag nesting tunnels. Uh, and so it's the only member of its genus also. So then they flew us from Santiago down to Ushuaia, where we met the Silver Cloud. Uh, this is the mega yacht that we took on our expedition here. And um, so the first thing I did when I got booked into my room was to leave the ship and go bird watching uh, around the harbor. And um, there was somebody throwing out fish heads somewhere, and uh, this is the dolphin gull. Uh, I like the bill on this one. This is a nice adult. We also had uh, immatures there. Um, but I think that the combination of the red orbital ring outlined by white uh, gives this bird a somewhat crazed look. Doesn't it look like it's on some drug that it's illegal to have? <laughs> anyway, um, this has gone under a number of different names. Scoresby's gull, I think, is an older name for it. Um, anyway, uh, uh, pretty interesting. I like gulls. And this guy uh, with red goggles is the Magellanic cormorant. And there was a nest on a derelict boat that I had actually seen this same bird probably on that boat on its nest uh, on an earlier trip to Ushuaia. Um, so the next thing that happens is they put us on a bus and take us up to have lunch. And after we're done with lunch, we go out and it turns out that the plan is to take us on a birding trip. And the leaders of the trip was a guy named um, um, Peter Harrison. And Peter Harrison was um, the person that Al talked about last week uh, who helped describe the new storm petrel that they found uh, in Chile. 
and the author of uh, some of the seabird guides that I have used, uh, two different seabird guides that he's published. Um, and uh, he uh, owns a bird watching tour company uh, called Apex Tours. And they had a group that was on this ship and they uh, were doing bird watching. And so we were all bird watching. And in fact, it ended up that there were no fewer than seven ornithologists on board this ship. Uh, they were giving different programs. It was very bird uh, focused. And uh, I was extremely pleased to have that opportunity. I was the uh, eighth most famous ornithologist on board that ship. So uh, it turned out to be, uh, it turned out to be uh, exceptional. So the first destination is to get over to um, the Falkland Islands. Uh, and it's 390 miles there from uh, Ushuaia and you pass um, Cape Horn. Uh, and um, you can see the Falkland Islands are kind of divided into two groups. And we headed over to the, the Western Islands, which are much less inhabited uh, than the Eastern Islands and made a couple of stops there. Uh, in Argentina, um, these are called the Las Malvinas, and they insist that they are occupied illegally by Great Britain. Uh, so Great Britain considers them a, an overseas territory. Argentina insists that these are part of uh, Argentina. Um, in any event, uh, the Drake's Passage there is a great place to look at seabirds and including albatrosses. And you can take a look at what the weather looks like uh, on the Drake's Passage here. You might get a little bit of sense of what the wind and the uh, waves were like. But this ship was stabilized with modern stabilizers. So even though it looks like a really rough trip, you don't feel it at all on the Silver um, Cloud. Uh, is that the name of the ship? Silver Cloud, yeah. So there are two species of royal albatross, uh, according to eBird, uh, the southern and the northern. And this one looks a bit like the northern in that the upper wings are all dark. Uh, another thing, it's not though. Uh, I, I eventually decided that this was a southern uh, a royal albatross. And the um, identification of some of these large albatrosses is pretty uh, tricky. In, in particular, uh, there's the wandering albatross, um, the snowy subspecies, and that usually has a dark tail. So the thing is, if you're looking at one of these great albatrosses. We're talking a wingspan of like 11 feet here. These are big albatrosses. Um, and you see a white tail, then you have a good chance that you're going to onto a royal albatross and one of the two. Um, if you look at the leading edge of the wing there, you see it's white. Um, so I've pretty much uh, figured out that this is a second cycle southern royal albatross. Now, the adult uh, southern royal albatrosses have much more white on the upper wing than uh, this one does. Anyway, uh, just one of the seabirds that we saw on our uh, at many, many days at sea. Uh, unfortunately, the camera that I had at the time is not great at taking pictures of uh, seabirds in flight or any kind of seabirds at sea. Uh, but uh, anyway. I managed to get that one. So the original plan was to uh, pull into a place called New Island. You see that over there on the left. And we got to New Island and the weather was too bad that we were not able to get into New Island. Um, and uh, the weather around the Falkland Islands is always pretty iffy and you never have any guarantees that you're gonna be able to get off and go uh, on to exploring these uh, uh, the, the islands. So, um, but um, they made a, an executive decision and instead of doing New Island, we did Carcass Island. And I've just marked that on the, on the map over here. Um, you can see where that is, a little island that's a little bit more sheltered uh, than New Island. Uh, New Island is kind of exposed. 
Now, Carcass Island certainly sounds like a destination that everybody would want to go to. Doesn't that sound delightful? Let's go, let's go visit Carcass Island. Okay, um, so uh, instead of New Island, we, uh, we did Plan B and, uh, and Carcass Island. Um, and there's a ton of birds on Carcass Island. I didn't see a whole lot of carcasses, by the way. Uh, these are uh, upland geese, uh, but you know, they're not really geese. Uh, they're more closely related to uh, shell ducks than they are to uh, geese. Uh, in particular, in geese, you'll, ever, you'll notice that the males and females always look alike. And in ducks, the males and females usually look different. Well, here you see that these things look quite different. So the upper bird on the left there is the male uh, upland goose, and then there's the female on the lower right. The males are dimorphic. There's a, a barred morph, which is quite common on the mainland, but on the Falkland Islands, the uh, males are always all white on the chest, and so this is an example of that. It's uh, supposed to be um, a separate subspecies on the Falklands. I think they're a little bit larger than the mainland ones. Uh, and this is a bird that I've always wanted to see, having been to the Falkland Islands before and heard about this bird and uh, not seen it on my last visit to Port Stanley. Uh, and that is the striated uh, caracara, uh, locally called the Johnny Rook. And this species has been decimated by farmers, uh, ranchers who claim that they eat lambs. Uh, which uh, I think maybe they do. Uh, but the uh, total population, uh, it's now protected, um, but uh, the species was formerly common at Port Stanley and they're now gone there. Uh, this is a juvenile. You can see the gray legs and um, the uh, 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 dull pinkish uh, sear. Um, it's near threatened. Uh, they do mostly feed on carrion, um, but uh, the problem is local persecution on the, uh, on the uh, Falklands. We also visited an albatross nesting colony uh, where these black-browed albatrosses had large young. And uh, as you know, the strategy of a lot of the tube-nosed birds is the adults go away to sea for up to a week and fill up their crop with food and then come back for an hour or so to feed the babies. So the chances of seeing an adult uh, with the babies or feeding the babies is very slim. And here is an adult with two large chicks. And I think there's a picture here of them feeding the babies. You can see how the nests are built. They're quite elaborate nests made out of mud. And uh, skuas are, of course, terrors. Um, this is the um, brown skua, and there is a subspecies on the Falkland Islands that's a little smaller and more heavily marked. Um, I noticed from the photo that I didn't notice it at the time, but it's got a band on its legs, so probably part of some kind of research project. Uh, anyway, uh, this one uh, let people get pretty close uh, to it, including me. So, uh, but uh, watch out, don't pet them, they bite. And uh, cormorants. Uh, these are called imperial cormorants, and they're part of a complex of cormorants, which to me look pretty much alike, uh, called blue eyed shags. Uh, you can see these adults uh, in the front have these yellow, they're called caruncles uh, in the lores. And um, there's some immatures in the back that have a browner head and lack those. Um, and then on the mainland, uh, this species usually has white cheeks uh, or they're polymorphic with having some white in the cheeks. So um, each island uh, around the Southern Hemisphere has its own population of blue-eyed shag types. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, they've been split up into multiple different species, uh, which are extremely hard to tell apart, except uh, by looking at where you are. That is, if you know that you're on the Falklands, you know that this is the imperial cormorant uh, and not anything else. So 
uh, that's a heck of a way to identify a bird. And personally, I'm not that much of a splitter. I really wish they would lump all of these blue-eyed shags back together the way uh, they used to be. And because I have too many birds on my list and I'm trying to get it down to a manageable area. It's interesting, these thrushes, uh, I think I saw one of these in my yard the other day, didn't I? The uh, Austral thrush uh, has some resemblance to the American robin. It is in the genus Turtus. Uh, there are other subspecies all down in uh, the mainland, but this one is uh, found only on the Falklands. And it's interesting how many species of South American birds are described first from the Falkland Islands and then uh, other subspecies were found on the mainland. And so the Falkland Island subspecies is usually the nominate, the one that's the same name as the species, the subspecies is. I love ground tyrants. They're the, the funnest type of flycatcher because there's no trees, so they've learned to forage off the ground. This is the dark-faced ground tyrant. Um, and uh, this is also on Carcass Island on our walk out to the, uh, to the albatross colony. Uh, and I stopped by on the way back and uh, managed to get this picture. Uh, they leap off the ground going after insects. Um, there's a, a migratory race on the mainland. Um, unlike upland geese, we saw these kelp geese, but never in flocks. Uh, there's two males down on the bottom on the beach, and these, uh, uh, again, more closely related to shell ducks. They're really ducks rather than geese, and a female in the water there. I think I took that from the ship. Now, how do we get from the ship onto these islands? Zodiacs, and they're extremely fussy about everything. You have to have your footwear, wear these uh, rubber boots and you have to disinfect your footwear uh, every time you get off the ship and when you get back on to make sure you're not carrying any uh, seeds uh, or transmitting any non-native plants uh, which might take hold. So uh, the permits to uh, land on these islands are hard to get and they're very fussy uh, about this. So you can imagine the logistics of getting uh, 290 people uh, off the ship um, and then out onto Carcass Island and then all over the place on the island and then back. They did a wonderful job of this. I particularly enjoyed their Zodiacs, which were all brand new with new engines, unlike the ones in New Zealand with Heritage Expeditions, which were all on their last legs. Um, these are um, penguins. Uh, this is the Gen 2 penguin, and he's having fun. I love the way they flap their wings when they take off uh, across the uh, beach, scurrying away. Um, this is the third largest penguin in the world, and it's part of a group of penguins called long-tailed penguins. So take a look at the tail on that one, and that gives you an idea what's long for a penguin anyway. Um, this is the Magellanic penguin, and they breed in burrows here. And this is a migratory species, uh, and they pretty much finished nesting uh, at the time we were there. Um, very similar to the Humboldt penguin and to the um, uh, black-footed penguins of South Africa, but uh, uh, they differ in the number of bands across their breast and where they live. There's this uh, other weird uh, kind of uh, uh, songbird that I was having my lunch and this thing hopped up really close to me. I think it wanted to get fed. Um, and it's a Syncloides. And there's a whole group of these uh, Syncloides that are found in, uh, on the mainland. This is the blackish Syncloides. And um, Chilean birds have a yellow base to the mandible and on the Falklands, the bill's all black. So we were excited to see the all black bill. I'm sure you are too. Um, in any event, um, this uh, species is now considered near threatened. Uh, they're apparently declining for reasons that are rather murky. 
there's this Magellanic oyster catcher, and you can see the immature in the front with the darker bill tip and browner, and then the adult uh, in the back. Uh, looks a lot like the American oyster catcher. Um, it has a yellow eye ring, which uh, the American oyster catcher, I believe, has a red eye ring. You can see the yellow eye ring a little bit on the immature. It sort of makes the eye stand out a little bit more. The bill is thinner and longer than an American oyster catcher. And also, we're in the Falkland Islands, so this is a Magellanic oyster catcher. Don't need to worry about that. We uh, then um, uh, went over to, uh, uh, actually that uh, Magellanic was on Saunders Island. We did a, a different island that day. And now I'm on a, uh, the next day and uh, photographing long-tailed meadowlarks. Uh, we uh, actually, there's a dock uh, at Port Stanley and we were able to get in on the dock by just using um, what are called tenders, which are basically you get on a lifeboat and you take it to the dock and you get off. It's much more civilized than getting on these uh, Zodiacs. Uh, but uh, what happened here with this, uh, 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 long-tailed meadowlark. This, I believe, is the world's largest meadowlark. They're a little bit bigger than the meadowlarks we have. And, of course, the long tail is the least interesting thing about it. You know, here you've got this bright red breast. Um, in any event, um, we went out to uh, some headlands where there were some nesting uh, cormorants, and they took us by bus, and then people sort of walked back, and I lost track of the group and wandered around myself and spent a huge amount of time trying to photograph these uh, long-tailed meadowlarks. The thing about these is that the males and females look really different from each other. If you know about our no regular, you know, western meadowlark, eastern meadowlark, the typical meadowlarks, the males and females look alike. And they have a um, uh, polygamous mating system. Uh, and these, the females, don't have that bright red breast. So the females are easily distinguished from the males, and they're monogamous. So, you know, I think that there's actually some reason for all of this. In any event, uh, I got distracted by these um, steamer ducks. And if you visited Southern South America, you're familiar with there's a flying steamer duck, and there's a uh, flightless steamer duck. Well, these steamer ducks are all flightless uh, here in the bay right around um, Port Stanley. And that's the male uh, on the upper left and the female down below in the water. And I spent uh, a lot of time trying to get some decent uh, representative pictures of these. And it turns out these steamer ducks are hugely controversial. Um, because here on the coast, the steamer ducks are all uh, flightless. But if you get into the interior of the islands, the steamer ducks there fly. And so there's all of these reports, especially on eBird, of flying steamer duck from the interior of the island. And uh, as I got home and started to research this, I found that somebody had done some genetic work and found there isn't one bit of difference between the interior birds and the coastal birds, that the flying steamer ducks in the interior are the same as these flightless steamer duck on the coast. And they're both a separate species called the Falkland steamer duck. And I put this, I posted something about this and boy did I get a bunch of hate mail from people from the Falklands who were determined that they weren't gonna lose their their flightless, their flying steamer ducks, which they insisted were uh, indistinguishable from flying steamer ducks on the mainland. Anyway, um, I didn't see any flying steamer ducks on the Falklands, but I've seen them uh, elsewhere in South America. So, uh, okay, so what happens here is I got lost and I couldn't find my way back to the ship. <laughs> And the ship was about to leave like at four o'clock. And here it was, it was getting to be like 3.30. And I had no idea how it is I was going to make it to the ship. And uh, I ended up hitchhiking and got picked up by a, uh, a local who uh, recognized that I did not belong there and I definitely needed help. 
and made it back to the last uh, tender to get on board the ship. Uh, it would not have been a good thing to have uh, missed that ship. I might still be on the Falkland Islands. They were not about to. They were not about to wait for anybody who was late. Okay, so next trip is 770 miles to South Georgia. Now, I have no idea why this is called South Georgia, because somebody please tell me where is North Georgia? Nobody, well, you can't talk, you're all muted. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, South Georgia is this um, major island inside the Antarctic Convergence. So, the birds that are found in Antarctica are largely the same as the birds that you can find here on South Georgia. Uh, access is quite a bit better, particularly on the north side of South Georgia, uh, because the wind and the bad weather all comes in from the south. And uh, so we had five days to spend at South Georgia. And most ships that go to South Georgia, they only have like three days. Uh, we had five days. I think we made landing on four out of those five days. Uh, we, were, we had pretty good weather. So our first stop is the uh, Salisbury Plain. Um, and we were greeted by these penguins. This is the Salisbury Plain and you can see the glacier off in the distance. Uh, and these are king penguins. And this is a triad. There's two males and a female. And uh, they have some kind of a relationship going on where they're uh, um, talking to each other uh, and sounding quite a bit like a kazoo. Uh, and they have this brilliant day glow orange color on their um, breast and uh, the side of the neck. And that color is produced, for a long time they didn't know what it was. It's a pigment and it's only recently been isolated and it's called sphenisken. And it's this orange pigment that only penguins have. Um, so. Anyway, um, so these triads are like the meters and greeters. So you get on this zodiac and you get onto the island there and these little groups of, of king penguins come running up to you and greet you, you know, uh, you know playing their, the, the kazoo and they wanna know how your day was. They're definitely very, very curious about human beings. So, at the Salisbury Plain, they have built a boardwalk that takes you up into the interior of the island. And you can see all this tussock grass there, where there's a small nesting colony of wandering albatross. Now, wandering albatross breeds on all of these different islands, and um, they um, some people have split them up into as many as five different species, of which this would be called the snowy albatross. Uh, eBird, to their credit, recognizes only one species of wandering albatross, uh, which uh, uh, is something I personally approve of. Um, if you look at the bill closely, you see that there's no black border between the mandibles. So right away that eliminates uh, any kind of royal albatross. Anyway, so this is a, an adult uh, sitting on the nest. This boardwalk that they built up there was quite controversial. A lot of people didn't want it uh, bringing tourists uh, up into the uh, albatross colony, but they built it anyway. Uh, the albatrosses are not at all af afraid of human beings and they can uh, breed until quite, quite a ripe old age. And then the fun things are these little puppies that come up and greet you uh, on the island. Uh, this is the um, Antarctic fur seal. And uh, the puppies are one thing. They come up, they run towards you, and they growl to try to play a dominance game. And uh, some of them, they sort of like want to see what your reaction is going to be. Can they make you run away? Uh, the best thing you can do about it is they'll bug you unless you ignore them. Um, in any event, the Antarctic fur seal was almost completely wiped out by sealing operations in the early 20th century. And now with protection, they've all come back 
There were a few uh, Antarctic fur seals that survived, and all of the Antarctic fur seals that are on South Georgia uh, and other uh, uh, South Atlantic islands are, um, are descended from that very small group of ones that escaped the uh, commercial sealing operations. Anyway, uh, look at that face. So um, the next uh, stop was, um, I can hardly pronounce this, it's got almost no vowels in it, uh, Gritvigan. Um, and it took us a day to get over there, I believe. But you'll see something called Fortuna Bay on the map. And at the mouth of that, there's a glacier, uh, which I will talk about later. Um, in any event, here is the town of Gritvigan. And what all of that rusted machinery is, is what's left of an old whaling station. And off to the right, you can see a painted building uh, with a flag on it. And that's the visitor center. And they have a little museum in there. Uh, and you can see the fur seals sort of lying around uh, all over the uh, kind of marine terrace there. Uh, there are glaciers uh, in the background and uh, lots of wildlife to see just wandering around. Now you notice that all of the people, you see the little people there have uh, red parkas on. Uh, these were all gifts from Silver Seas. Everybody got a free parka. Uh, and I think I know why this made it a little bit easier for the leaders to see if there were any stragglers uh, that were not getting back to the ship on time. So I wandered around looking for birds and I wandered into this little cemetery and found the, the gravestone of um, Shackleton, uh, the, uh, the great uh, explorer of the Antarctic who got stranded on Elephant Island to the south and made it up to South Georgia and climbed over the mountains of South Georgia to get to some whaling station and then uh, got a uh, rescue crew back to get the rest of his crew back from Elephant Island. Um, and that, um, and he rescued, I think almost all of the crew got rescued. Anyway, when Shackleton died, his uh, wife um, wanted him to, his, uh, to be buried on, uh, on South Georgia. He loved South Georgia. And so his remains were shipped to South Georgia. And there is a uh, visitors often, I understand, have a little ceremony there where you can get some whiskey uh, from the visitor center and uh, cheer the, the late gentleman. And uh, here are some more uh, cormorants or shags. This is the South Georgia shag and it's a member of the blue-eyed shag group. And the reason we know it's not an imperial shag is because we're on South Georgia. There are some subtle differences, perhaps a slightly darker face, but honestly, uh, not a huge amount of difference between these two. Um, they, uh, I think they're supposed to be um, uh, a very small number uh, of uh, Antarctic fur seals that occur in this white morph. Um, and if I can find my notes, I think it was like one in a thousand, something to that effect. Anyway, I found this one sort of off by itself, uh, away from the rest of the fur seals, seeming rather lethargic, uh, and it took his picture. Um, so then the next stop is Gold Harbor, and then, um, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, Godthal, actually, I think we made a stop there. No, Gold Harbor, I don't think we stopped at Godthal. Anyway, there's this glacier on the way uh, that uh, you can see it's uh, all the way out into the ocean. There really isn't much of a marine terrace there. Most of the glaciers on South Georgia are receding. A couple of them are uh, expanding. Uh, and uh, I think this is one of the ones that's expanding. And so now we are at, um, uh, I think I'm at Gold Harbor, uh, if I've got this correct. Uh, 
let me yeah i'm at gold harbor um with the um southern elephant seals and these are all teenage boys uh the adults are huge uh and uh there were some dominant games being played by these, uh, these youngsters. Uh, so there was this flock of, this herd of southern elephant seals. They're supposed to be the largest pinniped in the world. Uh, they were hunted to near extinction in the 19th century. They have recovered here, but in some other places they are still declining. In New Zealand, they are uh, seriously threatened and we don't quite know why. Uh, I believe they can weigh up to four tons, uh, and that's the adults. And there's these sheath bills, and they particularly, we saw them in these penguin colonies. This looks like an adult, but if you look at it real closely, you can see a few little black spots which are left over from immaturity. And these things walk around in the penguin colony, and they make a living eating penguin feces. I mean, they're like chickens. They're really strange, strange little white birds. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the way they make a living is uh, pretty gross, frankly, you know, but that's, uh, somebody's got to come in and clean it up, I guess. Here is a pair of uh, king penguins. And if you uh, look carefully, you might be able to see, you know what's behind them? Those are the elephant seals. Anyway, uh, so watch out, and an elephant seal might roll over on you. I like this picture because it showed the silvery color on the back of the king penguins. That's the male. They're slightly larger female on the left. We actually saw this, these, um, this pair copulating. And here is the breeding colony. So there's, there's really three things going on. There's the ones that are in the breeding colony, and they're all just packed in like sardines. There are the triads, which are like the meet and greeters. They're the ones that come running towards you when you get on there. And then there are the ones that are molting. And they are morose, they are antisocial, and they hang back as far away from the rest of the group as they can and look miserable while they are in the process of molting. So these birds uh, breed like twice every three years, uh, which is a little bit weird. And it might explain why are there, there are these three different types of uh, populations. If you look at here, can you count the number of king penguins? Anybody want to guess? Oh, I guess people have, are all muted. Um, anyway, um, uh, there is uh, somebody estimated uh, 25,000 in 2005 at this particular colony. Uh, recent eBird reports I looked up so I could put in my eBird number was 190,000. I don't know. Do you see those red ones off to the left? That's how you identify humans. And if you look closely at the one in the front, it's got an egg. That's a male sitting on an egg. And they have this pouch. The egg sits on their feet and then the pouch wraps over them and they just sit there with their wings, uh, their flippers held down and almost touching uh, the ground. And that's how king penguins incubate. But there were already some uh, large young, and uh, <laughs> this is interesting, the, the, the juveniles are sometimes, when they get a little bit bigger uh, and the colony disperses, some ornithologists went in and collected these birds and there were no adults around. The adults were all off feeding somewhere in the, in, uh, in the ocean. And they collected these and they says, this is a new species of penguin. We named it the woolly penguin. And they didn't realize it was the juvenile of the king penguin. And in the middle of this huge, huge conglomeration of king penguins was this little guy. And he seems so happy and he is so lost because <laughs> this is a juvenile macaroni penguin. And he has absolutely no business being in the middle of this colony. This was the first macaroni penguin that we saw. And uh, I took this picture. So now we're headed over to uh, Gold Harbor on the east end of the island. And um, 
this is where we got to see the adult macaroni penguins. And you know why they're called macaroni penguins? Uh, Yankee Doodle stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. And macaroni was a, a sort of foppish hairstyle that was adopted by young men in the Edwardian era. And this penguin was named after the hairstyle. They were called macaroni penguins for that reason. Apparently has nothing to do with pasta. From the Zodiac, we went around uh, the area looking for seabirds. And one of the really pleasant seabirds, I like them anyway, are these giant petrels. Uh, they have a bill that's more like a fulmar. Sometimes people confuse them with albatrosses, but the bill is not like that of an albatross at all. Uh, the tubes are not separated. They're connected onto the top of the bill. And uh, for a long time, there was thought to be just one species of giant petrel, and that was always fun. Uh, but then uh, quite a long time ago, they got split into the northern and southern giant petrel, and both of them occur on South Georgia, and they both hybridize with each other. Uh, but hybrids are apparently uh, fairly rare, and identifying hybrids is even rarer, because nobody seems to know how to identify the darn hybrids. The way you identify these birds is by the color of the bill tip. It's red on the northern, the northern, the northern giant petrel, and it's uh, whitish or yellowish on the southern giant petrel. Southern giant petrel is a little bit larger, so that's northern on the left, southern on the right. Not too often you have an opportunity to see both species together, so. I kind of like this photo in that it shows it fairly well. But do remember on your, uh, on your trips to put in a healthy number of unidentified giant petrels, because when you get them far away, it's really not that easy to see these bill colors. But one of them was the white morph. And only the southern giant petrel occurs in a white morph. Uh, the local sailors call these white nellies and they are almost entirely restricted to the Antarctic mainland, uh, the Antarctic continent. So CN1 in South Georgia was really unusual. And this one was extremely cooperative. Um, so there you go. The, the dark spots is on them, uh, the spots is uh, normal for uh, a, uh, a white Nelly. Uh, I don't believe this is an albino or a leucistic bird. I don't think it's an uh, abnormal thing. I think this is just, part of normal variation. Only the southern giant petrel occurs in this white morph. So if you see an all white one, that's definitely southern. There's one native land bird on South Georgia, and it's this pipit, the South Georgia pipit. And um, uh, this has got a kind of a fascinating story. Uh, they were almost wiped out by introduced rats. Now you saw the whaling station, the sealers and all of that. Uh, you can imagine that rats got introduced onto South Georgia and the rats did a number on this pipit. Uh, they'd eat their eggs, they'd eat their young, they'd eat anything they could. And uh, people I know who used to go to South Georgia back in the day said it was really hard to find the South Georgia pipit. There was very, very few of them at the time. Uh, and in fact, they were uh, uh, considered almost extinct. Um, and uh, the, uh, there's been a project. Uh, Friends of South Georgia has funded a lot of this. Um, to try to rid South Georgia of, uh, of rats. And uh, they used a method that was uh, developed in New Zealand uh, for um, trying to introduce these, uh, trying to reduce the rat numbers and eventually uh, get rid of the uh, rats entirely. Um, and uh, the method is this. They use a uh, very dilute solution of rodenticide, which doesn't kill the rats, but makes them sick. And a sick rat 
doesn't want to be out and about. It wants to go into its burrow and sleep, and they die inside their burrows. And what that means is that the rot rodenticide, there is no secondary effect. You don't have a bunch of dead rats lying around there with the, uh, uh, the uh, giant petrels coming in and eating them and getting infected by, this, uh, by the rodenticide. And with an island the size of South Georgia, it is quite amazing and it was a heroic effort. When we were there, they told us that the rats had been completely eradicated using this method. This is the method they want to use to eliminate the house mouse on the Farallon Islands. And if you recall, there were a whole bunch of people that thought that it was going to be a bad idea uh, to uh, uh, dump rodenticide uh, by helicopter on the sensitive habitat of the Farallon Islands. Um, and the, um, uh, you know, some, some environmentalists, uh, including myself, thought it was a bad idea. Uh, but uh, after having seen what uh, uh, that procedure has done with South Georgia, I'm now 100% behind these kinds of projects of trying to get rid of uh, rats and other invasive predators, uh, especially mammalian predators, on these remote islands. Now, these, this South Georgia pipit uh, survived on some offshore islands. It was gone from the mainland. But after they got rid of the rats, um, uh, they're now doing great. And the, the rat uh, was, uh, the island was officially declared rodent-free on May 9th, 2018, shortly after we visited. Okay, so from South Georgia, it's uh, almost 1,500 miles to get to Tristan da Cunha. And uh, a lot of seabirds happened uh, along the way. Uh, my camera wasn't really up to it. But we were fortunate to get to Tristan da Cunha, uh, the remotest uh, island is what they claim. Uh, and we landed at a, uh, there's a little bit of a port um, at the north end of the island, uh, which um, is called um, um, Scotland of the Sea. I don't know what it's called. Anyway, there was a little town up there. Um, and uh, they, anyway, they've got this sign here and somebody took my picture so I could prove that I was here. And you can see there's my Silver Seas jacket. I'm a little bit overdressed uh, actually, because most of the time you're just cold and uh, even on, on warm days, uh, you're gonna be cold on these uh, South Atlantic passages. Now, why is it the remotest island? I thought Hawaii was the remotest island or you know, there's some other places that might qualify as remotest. Uh, how do you get to be the remotest island? There's no airfield here. So the only way you can get in is by ship and the ships are only able to reach port uh, and get cargo on and off about one every three tries. And most uh, tr uh, ships that visit here, uh, they don't make it. They don't make it onto land. So we were fortunate on our first try to be able to make it. Boy, was it tricky. There is no place um, on the island that is really sheltered. Uh, weather comes in from all directions. And to get onto those zodiacs from that ship, okay, you go down a ladder, and then the, the zodiac is going up and down and up and down, and you have to step off while it's coming up or going down. And uh, th they did a great job of getting us all, all there. Here's a funny sign telling you how far away you are from everything else. And there's yellow-nosed albatrosses that nest on this island. Um, there's also a subspecies of, uh, of wandering albatross that's uh, basically almost extinct on this island. Um, but the yellow-nosed albatrosses come through and there's a little cliff and you can sort of stand there and photograph them as they come towards you. Um, this is the Atlantic yellow-nosed albatross. There's some different subspecies. Notice the uh, grayish face uh, on this uh, yellow-nosed. And you can see the yellow down the middle of the bill, which is why it's called yellow-nosed. And this was near the dock there. Uh, and uh, uh, these are Antarctic terns, um, which are really a little bit hard to tell from Arctic terns, but they have longer bills, uh, longer uh, legs. 
Uh, that's the adult up on top, and apparently the, these birds had nested on this structure, uh, and that's the juvenile uh, over on the left. Uh, there's different populations around uh, many different islands. I know Steve Howell thinks there's at least five different species of Antarctic uh, terns. These birds don't migrate the way the Arctic terns do. So if you see an Arctic tern with a black cap down there, that's not an Arctic tern, it's probably an Antarctic tern. Uh, there's also a South American tern, which I find really hard to tell from Antarctic tern. Anyway, it's called Edinburgh of the Seven Seas. That's the name of the little village that I was trying to remember. And it seems to be inhabited uh, mostly um, by a mixed um, um, marriage uh, offspring from South Africa. Um, uh, and I'm not sure what the whole deal is on that, uh, but uh, it was illegal to uh, have mixed race children in South Africa for a long time. So a lot of them seem to have settled uh, here on Tristan da Cunha. Uh, it is part of the British overseas um, territories, uh, but uh, the population uh, seems to be mostly South African. Uh, Gough Island is a couple of hundred miles off to the east uh, and uh, that's shown here on an inset. So we landed up at the top there at Edin Edinburgh of the Seven Seas and birded a little bit around there and uh, then came down here to um, Nightingale Island. And just above Nightingale Island, you can see uh, Middle Island. And off to the left is this wonderful place called Inaccessible Island. And uh, some of you are probably familiar with this great bird called the Inaccessible Island Flightless Rail. So there's a small rail, looks like a black rail, that lives only on Inaccessible Island. And apparently they're pretty common there. But the problem is that Inaccessible Island is uh, kind of inaccessible. There's a, a it, it, you know, we looked at it and there was no place to climb. There was no plane. There was no place you could really get in. They mostly get in and out by helicopter. Um, but they had this grand scheme about how we were going to see the inaccessible island rail anyway. They were going to get a couple of people on a Zodiac over there, scramble up there, and play the tape, the only known recording of the inaccessible uh, rail. Well, that all failed. There was no way we were going to get this, uh, these, these people uh, off the ship and onto inaccessible island that way. The weather did not allow it. There was pretty strong weather also there on Middle Island, uh, and we got in close. It was kind of late at night, so the photos didn't come out as well as I really wanted to. But this is a very poorly known bird called Mosley's Rockhopper Penguin. And it's been split from the Southern Rockhopper Penguin uh, based on, uh, on genetics. It also looks a whole lot different uh, with a really foppish hairstyle. Um, and this species is, I think, critically endangered. On Tristan and on Goff, there's been a decline of over 90% of these Mosley's rockhopper penguins. And the causes of this decline are uh, murky. Nobody seems to really know uh, what it is that we can do to save this species. Um, they're just not doing well. All right, uh, so I tried to take pictures of seabirds, and uh, this is about the best I could do to try to photo photograph a prion. Uh, there is a number of different species of prions. The most common prion in this area, and the one that breeds on Gough Island and on um, uh, Middle Island and a bunch of the other islands there, uh, is the broad-billed prion. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, after, there's a lot of dead prions on these islands. The skuas come in and eat them, uh, and a lot of remains leave the head. And so they collected a bunch of these, and a bunch of these broad-billed prions had much smaller bills than the regular broad-billed prions. So there was a question as to what they were, so somebody decided that these were Salvin's prions. Well, the Salvin's prion is found only in the Indian Ocean. What made them think that this thing on, on uh, Gough Island was going to be uh, Salvins? Um, and then somebody else suggested that they were actually McGillivray's prion, which has been split from Salvins. 
but it's also found only on an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and it seems really unlikely there's very few of those birds. Like, why do they think that those are uh, Salvin's prions and McGillivray's prions? Anyway, there was a whole lot of com natural competitiveness in trying to identify what kind of prions we were seeing. And I eventually gave up. Um, but uh, I can tell you this, um, that Peter Harrison uh, thinks that he has cracked the code on how to tell these prions apart. And he was calling a bunch of these things salvins, while uh, the regular staff ornithologists were calling them McGillivrays. And I talked to him about that, and he says, I, I don't want to argue with them. I'll tell you about it, but just you and me. These are, the, you know, it's kind of weird. Um, anyway, we talked about some of the differences. One of the things you can see here is this big bulging forehead. I think this is, I finally decided this is a broad bill prion after all. So anyway, uh, there's this undescribed species. I think the best thing to call it is the, the Gough Island prion or something like that. Um, and I did see them, but uh, there's been some papers submitted uh, trying to describe it as a new species, but those people don't have any genetic work. They don't have any way to compare the genetics between them and Salvins and McGillivrays because they're, they're on Gough Island. How the heck are they going to do that? So their papers have not been accepted for publication. So we're still stuck with an unidentified prion. It's not the only unidentified prion around there. There's a bunch, there's a few others. Anyway, this shows you where Gough Island is. It's down to the south. Um, we went there in a horrendous storm. I had some of the best seabirding I've ever had in the middle of that horrendous storm because uh, that ship has a, um, a viewing area that is uh, by far the best viewing area I've ever seen. Plate glass windows, you're inside, it's like a, um, uh, uh, in the front of the ship, and you sit there in a, in a comfortable chair and watch all of these uh, albatrosses and pterodromas and petrels and all of this stuff uh, uh, in front of you. Uh, and you're just looking through plate glass, which doesn't steam up uh, for some reason and it doesn't have water droplets all over it and it never seemed to get dirty. Uh, I was really impressed. I had a, a heck of a fun day there. Anyway, it's a haul to get from there to uh, the Cape of Good Hope, uh, which was our final destination. And although we saw some, um, some interesting birds along the way, it wasn't uh, uh, as productive as the rest of the trip. Uh, but I mentioned that Peter Harrison was uh, uh, one of the ornithologists on board, and uh, he put out in the hallway uh, some of the species plates. Uh, and Al told you that he was writing a new book on seabirds. And it's going to be two volumes, a handbook to seabirds of the world. I love the way if you ever see handbook, that always means you can't hold this thing in your hand. I don't know why they name these things handbooks. Um, written and illustrated by Peter Harrison. And then they're on the on the end there, it says, end is nigh for islands bird eating giant mice. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that, but before I do, I wanna show you, uh, these are just very quickly, I took these uh, pictures because he didn't really want uh, people taking pictures of his, uh, of his plates, but this is what the new um, seabird guide is going to uh, look like. Um, in any event, um, what has happened is there's no rats on Gough Island, but there are mice, there are house mice. And these house mice have evolved to be as big as a rat. Uh, you know, who knows why? And uh, they are causing huge amounts of damage to the seabirds on Gough Island. Particularly, this is the last place the Tristan albatross, or a race of the wandering albatross, breeds. And um, it's, um, it's pretty gross because the adult albatross has to leave the nest when the chick is in there and spend um, multiple days at sea 
to get uh, food for the chick. And while the chick is just sitting there on the nest, the mice come out and crawl all over the chick and eat them alive. And so the albatross situation on Gough Island is critical. So the plan is to use the same strategy that was used to uh, remove rats from South Georgia to get rid of these mice. Um, and uh, I tried to donate to the project, which is under the auspices of the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. And they, for some reason, couldn't accept my credit card. And um, then I wanted to send them a check and I never heard back from them. And eventually I wrote to Peter Harrison and he has a, a US conduit uh, to um, donate uh, to this project. So uh, I donated uh, uh, a, uh, to getting rid of the, uh, of the mice on, uh, on Gough Island um, because um, you know, that albatross is all but wiped out on Tristan and uh, this is its last hope. So eventually we make it over to Cape Town and um, I had a couple of days to spare there. And um, so I discovered that an Uber from the ship's dock to Cape Town cost 10 US dollars to the, uh, to the uh, Kirstenbach Botanic Garden where I've birded before. And uh, this is the Cape Sugarbird. Uh, with the tail about three times or two times as long as the bird itself. Uh, this is probably a male. You can see some uh, feathers growing in. It's molting its tail. And they feed on nectar, uh, primarily of uh, protea. Uh, and this is, I think, the giant protea, uh, which is one of the favorite uh, nectar plants of the um, Cape sugarbird. Sugarbirds are in their own family. Uh, the last time I was at uh, Kirstenbach, we didn't see any sugar birds, but uh, there were a lot of them flying around uh, on this particular visit. I had a great time uh, trying to photograph them, and I have an even greater time trying to photograph this bird, which not nearly as impressive. This has the <laughs> wonderful name of somber green ball, and what it is, is this thing is sings all the time in the canopy over and over and over again and it's maddeningly difficult to see. They don't move. They just sit there in the canopy, blend in, do not move, don't do anything except make a whole lot of noise and frustrate you. And I couldn't believe it when I actually saw this bird. I said, oh my God, there it is. And I probably, you know, exposed many more pixels than I needed to. I was probably even more excited to see this thing because, uh, you know, it kind of reminds me of some birds in the neotropics that make a whole lot of noise and are just uh, uh, really frustrating to, to be able to see. This is one of the largest pigeons uh, in, the, uh, in Africa called the Ramaron pigeon. Uh, differs from speckled pigeon in its yellow bill and yellow eye ring, and this one's quite a bit bigger. Um, I was considered myself lucky to see one and get a picture. These are really common. These are uh, sunbirds. Uh, sunbirds are sort of like hummingbirds. In fact, these birds even do ho uh, hover sometimes, but they feed in flowers. They're nectar feeders. This is the southern double collared sunbird which violates all of the rules about having the bird name not be longer than the bird itself. But um, anyway, I tried to get a little bit of the uh, iridescent color that they have on the throat. So almost convergent on, on a hummingbird, uh, but a totally different family. The sunbird family is sort of the old world replacement uh, for nectar feeders. Um, this is a robin chat, this is the Cape robin chat. And uh, uh, they were just really photographic, uh, uh, po posing nicely for, uh, for photography uh, and uh, quite attractive uh, little birds. So I was pleased to be able to get some, uh, some nice pictures. They used to be categorized as thrushes and they're now uh, considered to be old world flycatchers, musket capity. This rock kestrel uh, has been split from the common kestrel 
Uh, males and females are pretty much alike. That's one reason uh, and a bunch of other reasons too. I think it's a good split. Um, and uh, uh, I was pleased to see this guy. I hadn't seen one before. Uh, it's called the Cape Canary. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the male with the gray nape. And uh, it's just a wonderful place to go bird watching. And there are eagle owls in the trees there, which look a whole lot like great horned owls, but their face is a little bit grayer, different kind of pattern in the face, uh, and uh, closely related to, to great horned owl. There's a whole bunch of different eagle owls. And to be honest with you, I did not uh, bring a field guide with me to, that included South Africa. I was all prepared for South America and the South Atlantic, but uh, South Africa was kind of an afterthought. And here I am trying to do an eBird list, just guessing what these birds were. So everything else is called the Cape this and the Cape that. So I put these down as Cape Eagle Owls. And boy, did I get dinged by the local eBird reviewer for that. Um, I, I had to change a whole bunch of species uh, after I got home and got an actual field guide. So that was the end of a fantastic trip. And uh, as I was waiting for Uber to uh, pick me up, um, I had carried uh, my um, iPad in a, in, a, uh, in a backpack. And in arranging that, getting the iPad out of there, I dropped my camera onto the pavement of the parking lot. And uh, that was the last of that SX-50, which is probably a good thing because I needed to upgrade anyway. Uh, but um, <laughs> that, that camera uh, kind of bit the dust. It had dropped over five times since then with no ill effect, but the, the last time on the pavement was bad enough. Anyway, that's it. Thank you so much for your kind attention and for being so polite and not speaking. Any questions? Now you can speak. You can unmute um, and you can, uh, you can ask questions in chat as well. I will be monitoring the chat. Thank you, Joe, that was wonderful. And it was great for me to revisit South Africa there when you, when you ended there. And, uh, but boy, do I ever wanna go to some of those remote islands, even inaccessible ones. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I bet I bet there's some good lichen there too. Just okay. <laughs> Not that I would know, but there was a lot of lichens. <laughs> mm. All right. So, uh, questions or thoughts? Again, I'll be monitoring chat. When when this is Peggy, and I don't know. Um, this is a weird picture now. Um, when you were telling, you know, from here to here, from here to here, I was wondering how many days it took um, each time you went from one place to another. What about that longest stretch at the end? Yeah, uh, I've got some notes on that. Uh, there was some periods of time there at the long stretch at the end. Okay, I arrived in Cape Town on the 20th of March uh, the Mosley rockhopper penguins were on the 13th of March. Okay. Uh, so between the 13th and the 20th, we were uh, pretty much at sea. Either that or we were um, uh, in areas where there were seabirds, but I wasn't doing a whole lot of seabird photography. My camera just wasn't up to, the, to what it takes to do. Seabird photography is, I think, about the most difficult kind of photography there is. First, I think bird photography is pretty difficult, but, um, um, and I'm using these, um, these kind of um, uh, point and shoot uh, ultra zoom cameras. Yeah. And they're, they're fine if you've got a bird sitting there, you know, I mean, I got some decent photos. I'm, I'm pleased with some of them, uh, but uh, I'm only now getting into uh, learning how to take pictures of birds in flight. And uh, you, you can do it, but uh, uh, you know, I wasn't using burst mode and a lot of the uh, seabird pictures were just too blurry. So that was a, lo a long stretch. 
Um, but it was a, a particularly boring stretch too, that, that particular one uh, uh, after we left uh, Gough Island. Uh, there was a couple of spectacled petrels that was following the boat, which was interesting. I sh by, by all rights, I should have had photos of those, but I didn't. And, um, and then there was, a, I remember about three days of almost no birds. Mm -hmm. So that happens on these, on these cruise ships. I've, uh, my understanding is the cruise ship as you, industry, as you know, is completely closed down mm -hmm. uh, or almost completely closed down. Um, it's supposed to start up right now. They've got it closed down until the end of November. They're not saying when they're going to be starting up again. We've actually got, we're booked on a Silver Seas cruise that goes from uh, um, Peru, from Lima to New Zealand in mid-January. And at the time we booked it, you know, we had no idea that this, uh, uh, you know, situation was going to last as long as it did. Um, but if they cancel the trip, uh, I guess we'll get our money back uh, or they'll try to sell us on a big, great deal on a future trip, you know, one of those two. Uh, so right now it's just not happening, you know, at all. Um, There's a question on the table from uh, Ed Ching um, saying what, you said your SX-50 died so in looking for, you said upgrade, what would you suggest is a good camera for bird documentation and do you need the really long lens? And also he was wondering what you meant by a second cycle albatross. Um, I'll do the first one first. Um, uh, you think of molt uh, as the birds need to replace their feathers. All the feathers need to be replaced at least once a year. That molt is called the pre-basic molt. And all birds have to have at least one pre-basic molt each year. So if you think of molt as a cycle, then the second cycle is the second time it has executed a pre-basic molt. The reason I don't want to use the term first winter or second fall or something like that is I'm in the southern hemisphere. Uh, you, you know, these things uh, happen regardless of the season. So to think of it in terms of the bird, um, I think that uh, it's better to think in terms of cycles uh, than it is, uh, uh, you know, of any particular uh, age or um, uh, any particular uh, named season. As far as the camera is concerned, um, the uh, SX-50, I think I replaced it uh, with another SX-50. I really like that camera. Um, and it was a refurbished one and the lens housing fell off in the North Sea into the ocean. And I was never uh, that happy with that particular camera after that. I replaced it with an SX-60, which I still have. Um, but the latest one is the SX-70. Um, and uh, these have a zoom range of, um, you know, over, you know, 65 power. Um, they don't work that well at 65 power. They give you a very narrow field of view. Um, and both of those cameras have a viewfinder, which is uh, difficult, I find difficult to use. I look in there and I say, where's the bird? Um, but there's a new one called the SX-70. And that one's a little lighter weight. It's more built like the SX-50. And I bought one recently and brand new and I loved that camera. That camera has a much better viewfinder. Um, it has a different battery. Um, it seemed to me to be just a whole lot easier to take pictures with it. And I'm uh, really learning how to use the um, uh, sports mode to take flight shots. You know what I mean? You, you put it on sports mode, you hold it thing down and you try and keep the bird in the field of view and it worked spectacularly well well on day two i'm out in the field and i get error 60 lens error camera will now shut down i said what's this so i said well i don't know what that is so the next day i get the same lens error so and then an hour later the same thing so i have to reboot the camera you know two times I says, ah, oh, I love this camera. I don't want to have to send it back for warranty service, you know? So, um, 
so I said, if it happens again, I'm sending it back. So it happened again two days later, you know, error 60, lens error. And I looked up what that was and, you know, it can be caused by the camera being dropped. It can be caused by a grain of sand in the lens. These cameras are not built that strongly. They are plastic gears in there. The motor that runs the thing, you know, we're, we're zooming all the time. Uh, so, um, um, anyway, uh, I sent it back and turns out Canon does not bother to replace, to, to fix them. They just send you a new one. And I have a new one. It's supposed to be arriving tomorrow. Um, and I love that camera. If it only doesn't have these darn, you know, computer errors in it, you know, that, uh, that there was nothing wrong with the camera and I couldn't, that I could see and I couldn't make it happen. In other words, there was nothing I could do to induce it to have this particular error. So I couldn't, you know, uh, you know, uh, even think about fixing it. Uh, I haven't had that problem with any of the other uh, zoom cameras. No, these are not as good as an actual good camera with an expensive lens. You're going to get much better pictures, uh, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 um, uh, with a real camera and a real lens. But for me, the big difference is this thing is something I can hold in my hand and it doesn't cost as much as my car. It's, you know, uh, I, I spent under $500 uh, for the SX70 um, and I take it with me everywhere. Uh, it's, it's a real handy little thing. And if I don't have my camera with me, I'm not gonna take any pictures. So it works for me. Uh, I'm not, you know, uh, looking to be, you know, the, get the great picture. I'm just trying to document rarities and also um, document uh, birds that I see on trips and stuff. And with COVID, what I've been doing is try to photograph every common bird in my area. That's been my big project. It gets me out every day and I'm trying to get the best picture I can of the darn chickadee. It's been a heck of a lot of fun, actually. I've been doing way more bird watching and way more photography during COVID than I ever did before COVID came up. So that was my, uh, that's, that's my thinking on that. So I, mean, I used to do a, 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 I have a program called Confessions of a Reluctant Photographer. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't want to be a photographer because I didn't want to, I know what happens with photographers is they, they spend all of the time trying to get the picture. They never really see the bird. I wanted to see the bird. So I did a lot of digiscoping for a while, and I still do a lot of digiscoping. But uh, these cameras are quite serviceable, and, and Nikon also has some uh, ultra zooms uh, that have gotten good reviews. Uh, so uh, I, I can't tell you what to do, you know, about that SX-70. Uh, that was such a disappointment uh, that I had to send it back. Uh, but I have a friend who's using it, um, um, uh, Chris uh, Hayward uses it, uh, and he gets great pictures. He always gets pictures of almost every rarity. So um, uh, that was one of the reasons that, uh, that I got it. It doesn't have a shoe for a flash. I don't need a shoe for a flash. I'm, I'm not using flash at all. Okay, that's, uh, anything else? I don't know if that helped. Yeah, there's uh, a question now from Shari Deggy. Um, she says, I think you were saying that the king penguins were in three groups, one of which were molting. Why do molting penguins separate themselves? Is it because they look ugly and do other birds separate themselves? <laughs> uh, it's the same reason that teenagers sulk and uh, get away from uh, their, their, their cohorts sometimes. Uh, it's an unpleasant time of transition is what I think of it as. Did you ever see what happens with a tadpole when it's trying to turn into a frog? If you ever raised a tadpole, boy, do they get morose when they are not a frog yet, but they're not a tadpole anymore. And I think that that is sort of just a psychological thing that these penguins that are molting, first off, they're having a really hard time swimming because all of those feathers have to be replaced and those feathers are what waterproof the penguin. So, you know, they, you've seen penguins swimming, you know, they're like little seals, you know, leaping out of the water and all of that. These poor molting penguins have to spend a heck of a lot of time 
not doing anything because they can't do anything. They can't really swim. Um, I mean, they can, but uh, I, I think it's much less effective. Uh, their, their capture rate is really poor and there doesn't seem to be much else to do. So it's just like, please let's get this over with. And uh, that's, that's my thought. Also, it requires quite a bit of energy to replace those feathers. So if you're doing a lot of other things at the same time, like meeting and greeting things, you're using up energy that you really want to use uh, to grow those new feathers. So this is why birds that are molting, for example, don't usually migrate. Uh, migration has got high energetic cost. Uh, and um, so you don't want to have extra energetic cost, like molting your feathers at the same time you're trying to migrate. So you do one thing at a time. You breed in one place. You don't molt your feathers while you're breeding. Breeding cause is, a, is a high energy uh, consumption activity. You don't migrate while you're molting. You molt someplace. And a lot of birds will like, they'll migrate a short distance, stop, molt, and then move on after they finish molting. So that's mm -hmm. sometimes called molt migration. Anyway, that's my view on why it is that they're kind of morose. They, no, I, I'm, I'm, it's certainly anthropomorphizing. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This was a, a wonderful program. And I really missed being able to laugh out loud as often as, as, your, as your monologue led me to, to laugh. Um, oh, I, heard, I heard everybody laughing a lot. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, it's also wonderful to- We to, were. <laughs> it's wonderful to think about a time when it was possible to travel so widely. And I look forward to such a time happening again. Um, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. We very much appreciate it. And next month, we're going to have another um, excellent speaker, Iona Saratin, who is um, one of the recipients of the ABA Young Birder of the Year Award and is now one of the co-editors of um, of in Birding Magazine, one of the youngest ones. And she's currently working with um, the East Bay uh, Bird uh, Rehabilitation uh, Group, and she's going to be speaking to us from the East Bay about her encounters with birds. So anyway, I'm looking forward to that as well. Hope you can all make it. And in the meantime, please stay safe. Um, and if you are exploring in the areas near where the CZU fire happened, please keep in mind that weakened trees can snap and fall much more easily. So please be cautious. Uh, but get out there and bird. And again, thank you for being here. And we look forward to seeing you in, at future meetings. Uh, thank yeah. you all for being so well behaved during this evening. <laughs> thank you. Sorry about Joe, that. thanks. Nice talk. <laughs> thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. It was great, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. Yeah, oh, is this going to be on the web? Much. Did you record yes, it? Yes, well, we, we've recorded it and we will post it. Okay, sounds yeah, good. We'll Thank get you. it up there in a couple days. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. We'll get the check in the mail. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thanks for your support for Sequoia. It means a lot. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good Thank to hear you. you. All right. Well, good night to you all. I am extraordinarily tired. And uh, so I'm going to head off. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. I think I sent it to the cloud, Davina. I sure hope so.